Can you see me behind this? Yep. Okay. Well, again, welcome everyone. I apologize for uh, the significant delay in getting going with our coffee and conversation today. Uh, we had a little electronic problems. Hopefully now it, they're all sorted out. Uh, again, I'd like to welcome you to our 192nd Coffee and Conversation. And we're so fortunate to have Ryan Wolf back. Ryan has been a previous Coffee and Conversation speaker with us. I think it was toward the end of last year. Uh, and Ryan talked about his service in the Army, in particular uh, his time in Afghanistan uh, with one of the brigades of the 10th Mountain Division. And we're planning to get Ryan back in November to talk to us about the impact of, of the World War I armistice on the shape of the world today. Again, a very timely topic. Uh, for today, uh, Ryan's going to talk to us about a topic which we all need to learn much more about. Those of us who've kind of looked at ourselves as being the Vietnam War veterans, well, we now have a whole new group of young veterans that we need to better understand and welcome into our overall fold. So without further ado, Brian, or Ryan, excuse me. Thank you, is it, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Great, well, I'm gonna go ahead and take my mask off yeah. since, and since the uh, front row is, is um, empty here, I, I may wander a little bit, so but I'll try and keep the social distancing. So thanks for having me back. I really, um, really appreciate it. I think that this is a great organization, the museum, the coffee and conversations are, are outstanding. I, I love everything that's happening here. And one of the reasons I love everything that's happening here is because it is local. And you'll hear me talk about that a little bit later, about um, community and, and local and keeping things local when it comes to veterans, because that's really where this, the phrase, all politics are local, well, you know, veteran communities are local as well. So um, what I'm gonna talk about is GWAT vets and where do we fit in? And GWAT, as we all know, the military loves acronyms, right? We have acronyms for acronyms. The military is the only, only place that I've seen that can take a three letter word, which is car, and turn it into a three letter acronym POV, personally owned vehicle. Same thing for gun, G-U-N, and then turn it into a, a POW, personally owned weapon, right? So we have the acronym GWAT, which is Global War on Terrorism, right? So we're gonna talk about the GWAT veterans, that generation of veterans, and kind of figure out where do we this uh, GWAT generation of veterans fit into the veteran community. But first, a little bit about me. Um, so as mentioned earlier, I am Ryan Wolf. Um, I live in Broomfield. I've lived uh, in this community since we moved to Colorado. Uh, going on our fourth year, um, I've got a family of five. It was move number 10 for us, so hopefully uh, we're done with the moves. You don't get like a punch card, right? I don't get a free sandwich after 10 moves. So we're just gonna go and stay put for a while. Um, family of five, I have uh, three daughters. All of them are in the Adams 12 school district. Um, and my wife and I both live, uh, as I said, here in Broomfield. Um, as mentioned earlier, um, I'm a 2004 graduate of uh, the United States Military Academy. And then after that, I spent eight years in it as an infantry officer. Most of that was in the 2nd Battalion, 30th Infantry Regiment, uh, which was in the 10th Mountain Division. And I know that there's a long story history of the 10th Mountain Division in Colorado. Now the 10th Mountain Division lives up in Fort Drum, New York. Um, so it's famous for the ski soldiers, for the snow. Well, I was in the one brigade of the 10th Mountain Division that was in the swamps. We were down at Fort Polk, Louisiana which in August, because we were part of the 10th Mountain, we got issued the new cold weather gear in August in Louisiana. So that went, that went into storage and stayed in storage for me. And when we went to Afghanistan, everybody's packing up, it was on the packing list, and I said, you know, I'm a light infantryman. I don't need all this cold weather gear. So I uh, left my cold weather marshmallow pants at home and regretted that decision, because it was cold. Um, so a little bit about what I do quickly, um, and then we'll get into the good stuff. I am a consultant now. After my uh, eight years in the Army, I, I did a couple things within corporate America, and then now I do consulting. 
two organizations I work with. One is called Spartan 36 Solutions, and we do uh, startup solutions, help startup organizations, and uh, process improvement for, for companies. And the other one is Fifth Principle, which um, Fifth Principle LLC, you can kind of see our logo down here. Really cool organization. Um, made up of almost all former military folks, a lot of the kind of most senior non-commissioned officers uh, throughout the, the military have been are, are part of the team. So it's a great organization, fun to work with, and we really come in and, and do leadership development for companies and organizations, but really take that senior NCO look at things as opposed to, um, you know, kind of my officer brain wanting to come in and plan. These guys can really come in and build teams of character. All right, so now let's get into the good stuff. So GWAT vets, what is a GWAT vet? Well, as I mentioned earlier, GWAT stands for Global War on Terrorism. Now, we are still in the midst of this global war on terrorism. It's not making the news as much anymore. We don't see a lot of the, um, the fighting and conflicts that are going on anymore, but it is still very much alive throughout the world. It is America's longest war, 19 plus years in running. It's been over 19 years since September 11th, right? So this war has lasted a long time. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you have parents seeing their children go and deploy and fight in the same place that they did, right? And you saw that at the beginning of the war, it would have been at the general officer level, and and senior NCO level and then junior enlisted or junior officer, but now you're seeing it from folks who were junior uh, members of the military. Now their kids are going and enlisting or becoming officers and fighting in the same place. 19 years is a long time to fight the same war, especially in the modern era. And where is this taking? Well, another thing that kind of makes the global war on terror differently, different than some of the other conflicts we've seen in the past is that it is, we're fighting across multiple fronts, right? Afghanistan and Iraq, Syria makes the news, all across Africa, right? There are places all across the world in which we are still engaged in this conflict. So not only is it long, it's very geographically dispersed. In addition to that, there have been multiple deployments, right? Deployment is the term used that, that we in the military are using for folks going off and, and um, deploying to one of these zones, one of these conflict zones, right? So the GWAT vets have been doing this for a long time. They've been doing it at a lot of different places and they've done it more than once for the most part. And we'll talk about some of that. Now, before I move on, I do want to say one thing. All right, all veterans are the same and all veterans are different. And I think a lot of the people who um, are in this room and who are watching understand that. So what I want to do is highlight some of the differences from the global war on terrorism veterans, right? And we all know that veterans face issues when they come home. Veterans faced issues when they were doing their jobs, right? And the issues that everyone faces are difficult for those individuals. And I do not at all want to imply that the current generation of veterans has it harder or worse than the ones in the past. It's just different. Just like we would say that a World War I veteran is different than, say, a Vietnam veteran, or a Vietnam veteran is, say, different than a Civil War veteran, right? There are a lot of similarities. And what I love about this community is a global war on terrorism veteran can sit down with a World War II veteran, era veteran, and they can speak the same language. They can have the conversations, and there are those similarities. But what I wanna talk about are some of the differences, and we can talk about who these global war on terrorism veterans are, and then we'll talk about where do we fit in. All right, so are global war on terrorism veterans different? So here's a few statistics, all right? And you can see the charts, and we'll talk a little bit about them, but basically if we wanna look at Quickly, if it's green, it's a post 9-11 or global war on terrorism veteran. If it's this yellow, orangey color, it's a pre 9-11 or pre global war on terrorism era veteran. 77% of the 
of post 9-11 veterans have been deployed. This was from a survey conducted last year, so it's fairly recent, all right? 58% of all the veterans, so over half, have deployed into a combat zone. 47%, 47%, so again, almost half of all, all global war on terrorism or, um, or some sort of a distressing experience. And that's really contrasted, so twice the number or twice the amount of as a, as a percentage of veterans than say pre 9-11 veterans have experienced some sort of trauma. 35% have sought help for issues and 36% suffered from, from post-traumatic stress. So again, these numbers vary differently or greatly from um, from the pre-9-11 veterans, but I think something that is even more telling than that is if we look at this gap right here, right, 47%, half, say they experienced some sort of trauma, and only about a third say that they've gotten help for that. And more say that they suffer from some sort of post-traumatic stress than say that they've gotten help. Right? There's a gap there, there's an issue there in the help that we feel that um, these veterans need. So that's kind of one group of statistics. Here's another, right? and again, I'm gonna do more than just throw a bunch of numbers up here at you, but I think that it's important for us to lay this groundwork. Okay, so to kind of look at the slide here, Top is all veterans, middle is post 9-11, or GWAT veterans, bottom is pre-9-11, all right? Green is good, orange is bad, as we look at it that way. And what I think is key here, and what I think is key for our community and, and the community of veterans, is that post 9-11 veterans, 47% say that they had either somewhat or very difficult time readjusting to life when they got home. I mean, there's a lot of factors that can go into that, but the reality is that 47%, half of post 9-11 veterans have problems readjusting to civilian life. And I think everyone can kind of agree with this one, but as, again, as we look, we have green is good, orange is bad, all veterans, post 9-11, pre 9-11, right? Um, less than half of Post 9-11 veterans feel or need from the government, right? And 43% um, say that they've gotten less help than they need from the government. Now, finally, the last set of numbers that I want to throw at you is I think the most disturbing numbers that I have seen from all that. And that is that 68% of all veterans, not just post 9-11, 68% of all veterans say that the war in Iraq was not worth fighting. Two thirds of veterans have said that the war in Iraq was not worth fighting. Over half, 58% of veterans say that the war in Afghanistan was not worth fighting. So over half say that the war in Afghanistan was not fighting as of this survey by the Pew Research Center last year. All right, so what is this? This is a recipe for disaster when we look at veterans, all right? Global war on terrorism veterans have been deployed. Global war on terrorism veterans have experienced trauma. Global war on terrorism veterans have had difficulty reintegrating into society. They say that they are not getting the help from the government that they need. And additionally, global war on terrorism veterans do not see the wars that they fought in as worth fighting. So when you put all that together, Right? All that together, it kind of comes into a recipe like this burn barrel here. Right? It is just a recipe for disaster. All right? So enough doom and gloom. Let's talk about the, what we can do and how we can work with these 
um, veterans. So where do we fit in? And by we, I mean the, um, I'm going to say we a lot, so I hope I don't get too confusing. By we and where do we fit in, I mean where do the post 9-11 veterans, my generation of veterans, fit in? And then also what can we do, and we as in communities, and we as in veterans in general, what can we do to help us out? All right, there are three major things that we're going to talk about. The first thing we're going to talk about are resources. The second is advocacy. And the third, then, is community. All right. So resources. Well, what are resources? All right. What are the resources in which veterans need help with? First, and we looked at some of the stats from, um, from earlier, was just not getting the help that they need, transitioning and navigating the VA. And I can see some heads kind of nodding in here from folks who have tried to and, and still are continuing to navigate the VA. So if you go to the VA's website and look up um, the VSO, Veteran Service Organizations, which is where a veteran should be able to go to for help, navigating the VA and the local communities. You go and look up VSO Right? When I did, I thought, okay, we're going to see a couple, right? I'll see the American Legion and storied organizations like the American Legion, the Veterans of, of Foreign Wars. Um, what I found was 75 pages, a list of 75 pages of um, veteran service organizations in the uh, VA's registry. That is just overwhelming. It's an overwhelming number of organizations out there, right? So um, what we need and what, what all veterans need is help navigating this. Now, when I was um, teaching ROTC, uh, I was lucky enough to be in Indianapolis, and we were right next to a huge new VA hospital, the Routerbush VA Hospital. And it was a great facility. It was beautiful. It served the... Um, the Indianapolis and central Indiana region. I went there, and the thing they were excited to show me when I went there, they're like, oh, you've got to come and see the new post-9-11, the GWAT veteran area that we have. It's super cool. So I went there, and they're like, look, we have an Xbox. You can play video games here, which I appreciate the sentiment. However, you know, at the time, I was in my 30s. I've got kids. Um, I'm there because... I've had a multiple knee surgeries, and I was hoping to get medical help from the VA. I needed an x-ray done. I didn't go there to hang out and play Xbox. And in fact, I think that while the sentiment was good, what was seen there is we have to find a way to attract and to work with GOI veterans. Let's separate them and give them this cool toy as opposed to let's address the issues that um, was needed. So again, good sentiment. Probably not the best execution. Another thing with the VA is when you're working with the claims and the claims process, that can be a nightmare. I mean, you see on the news and you hear the statistics all the time of paperwork taking forever. You know, it's getting lost in the, in the transition, whether it's just getting the medical need or, or getting the, the disability claim or the GI I bill claim. Now, the problem is, and we've talked about this kind of earlier in an earlier conversation, is you almost have to know somebody who can rush it. You almost have to know somebody who can get your paperwork in. So if, if it is submitted to the VA, the waits take forever. And the VA is working on this, right? But the wait time is forever. But if you then go to your VSO, your American Legion, they'll have folks who can help you expedite it. If you go to your congressman or your senator, they have folks on their staffs who will help expedite it, right? And that, while it's nice that folks will help you do that, that then is another issue, that not only do you have to submit things, you have to then go and get somebody to help you out, right? So I was incredibly lucky, and this is an, um, a tale for me. When I was submitting paperwork to the VA, my older brother happened to be um, on the staff of a congressman who was on the VA committee. So I asked him to call and just check on my stuff. I hadn't heard from it. 
Next thing you know, two days later, I get a phone call with an appointment. Right? It shouldn't have to take somebody's brother being on the staff, on the VA committee's uh, congressional staff, in order to get that hap have that happen. But it does. And had that not happened, who knows where my paperwork would be today. So that is another issue and another way in which folks need help navigating the VA. What's great about this, though, is there are organizations that have been doing this for decades, right? The American Legion is amazing at this. The Veterans of Foreign Wars is, ama is amazing at this. Um, there's one within um, that's popped up recently. The Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America are great with this. So what we need to do is figure out how do we connect the veterans who are trying to do this on their own, filling out the form online or sending the paperwork in, into those subject matter experts, into the folks who have done it before and know what they're doing. Another issue with the same thing is the GI Bill. Right? The GI Bill changed, and the GI Bill is outstanding now, as the Montgomery GI Bill before it was very good too. And it's an outstanding program, and the GI Bill has been beneficial to millions of veterans, including myself. I, I got some benefits from it when I went back to school. So the GI Bill is great. But like anything else run by the government and like anything else run by um, the Department of Veterans Affairs, people need help filling it out, right? You need to be an electrical engineer to understand the wire flow chart in order to figure out how to do it. So that's another thing in which we can help these veterans connect to the subject matter experts in that. So who are these subject matter experts with the GI Bill, right? There's, the, again, the Legion. There's the, um, the VFW, Iraq, Afghanistan, Veterans of America and the universities. The universities and the community colleges have um, experts who can help with this. Right? And the GI Bill isn't just, we'll talk about this later too, isn't just for going back and getting your bachelor's or master's degree. It covers all types of training, right? From welding certifications to uh, pilot's licenses, all the way up through getting a doctorate. There are multiple ways in which veterans can use this resource. We just need to be able to get them to this resource. All right, the next type of resources that I in the numbers earlier is transition help. Transition help. Okay? Every single generation of uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, air, uh, women, Marines, Every single one has had some sort of issue with the transition, coming back to some sort of civilian life. Even all the way back to the ancient Roman Republic, Julius Caesar's soldiers would do their nine-year enlistment. They'd turn around, look at Rome, and be like, I don't want to live there. I'm going to go back in and do another nine-year enlistment. Right? So it is, a tra it is an issue that folks have had for centuries. And we are all... Um, familiar with the struggles and the issues that the Vietnam veteran generation had when they returned from Vietnam. I mean, in really the first welcome home parade was held in the 1980s for the Vietnam uh, generation, right? And that is not right, right? But we are also seeing another set of issues with the veterans today, right? First off, it is overwhelming. Navigating the resources out there are overwhelming. There are a lot of people, much like when we talked about the Xbox at the VA hospital, who have great ideas, who, have, who want to help, right? but it's to the point where it can almost be overwhelming at times. Right? So navigating those resources. Housing is another issue. Right? So think of your, um, your young enlisted soldier who leaves high school goes and enlists in the Army, Air Force, Navy, Marines, does a three, five, 10, 20 year career, doesn't matter how long it is, and then gets out and returns back to whatever community they go to. For many of them, it will be their first time ever signing a lease on an apartment or a home. I mean, you're, you're going from high school, your parents' house or wherever you lived, into barracks, and you stay in those barracks and or government housing throughout your career. 
So you can have somebody who is in their 40s who has never signed a lease on a home. And they don't know how to do it. Or somebody who's in their 20s or 30s, right? They don't know how to do it. It is a difficult and overwhelming and very stressful thing for a lot of these folks. Another is finding jobs. I was an infantry officer. I was a political science major before that. Not a lot of people were, were looking to hire me. Thank you for your service. We really appreciate you, everything you did. Let's hear a couple more stories and I'll keep your card in my desk, right? Now, if I wanted to be a police officer, if I wanted to be a correctional officer, if I wanted to be an armed security guard, tons of jobs were available. In fact, even after I'd had a professional career outside of the military, when I moved to Colorado and started searching for opportunities out there, one of the main ones that came up was armed security, right? I am out of the armed security game. I do not do that anymore. In fact, I'm probably not a person that you want to have doing your armed security. There are younger, faster, better people out there for, for that than me. But there have to be more opportunities for these folks out there. And what it takes, I believe, is people to recognize the intangible skills. Right? Just because you were a supply soldier in the Army, right? or just because you were a mechanic in the Marines, or a food services specialist in the Navy, that doesn't mean you have to transition to that role. That doesn't mean you have to transition to that job. Right? You have multiple things that you can do in order to help you find that job. Now, fortunately, there are a lot of ways in which we can help with that. When I was at um, a major corporation in Illinois, there was a, I met a young Marine, young enlisted Marine who was finishing up, using the GI Bill to finish up his, um, his bachelor's degree. And um, we got coffee and we talked for a little bit. This young Marine, like me, was an infantryman. This young Marine, like me, got, got out to be closer to family, to be home, have a little bit more stability. And this young Marine was about ready to graduate college and was uh, overwhelmed, was scared, didn't know what he was going to do. You know, should I go be a police officer like my friends? He could do that. You know, go do armed security. He could do that. What I was able to do, and, and, um, and this young man is outstanding, and, and I'm sure we'll all be working for him one day, um, I took his resume to my boss in an organization that was not known for hiring a lot of veterans. Um, took my resume to him, put it on his de took his resume to my boss, put it on his desk and said, hire this guy, right? We hired him, not somebody who, again, would typically be hired into that role, and he is doing outstanding. Multiple people came up to me over the next few years saying, man, where'd you find this guy? This guy's great, can we get more like him? Yes, yes you can. There are thousands more like him of men and women who are in that position who just need that boost to get in and prove that they can excel in the civilian world just like they did in the military. Last thing, and this kind of goes along um, with, it, with transition help, is, um, is jobs. I was a company commander in a, in a couple National Guard companies in southern Indiana, right? rural southern Indiana, over 30% over 30% of my National Guard company was unemployed. These young infantrymen um, who were in southern Indiana who were unemployed. The one who probably um, was out there fighting and trying hard to get a job, we really worked with this guy, became an over-the-road truck driver. It's a great career, it's a stable career, it's some, one we need, but not if you're in the National Guard. He can't be in Maine and then all of a sudden say, I have to get home in order to um, in order to get, be there for my drill. You are one week in a month, two weeks a year that we all remember from the commercials. It wasn't that, right? It was probably, you know, two, sometimes even three weekends a month. Those weekends were three or four days long. And your two weeks a year, we went ahead and added another week on top of that. And, um, and we put the weekends on the other side. So it's almost four weeks then is your one week in a month, two weeks a year, which again makes it difficult for employment for these folks. Right? So how can we help these folks? We need to help get them in there and get them access to meaningful employment. Right? Now, the last thing when it comes to advocacy, 
is um, suicide prevention. We've all probably heard the number 22, right? The number that 22 veterans a day of all generations of veterans commit suicide. Now, fortunately, that number is, is down, right? The number was from, uh, I think, 2010, and recently another, another analysis took place, and the number's down to 20 to 20, from 22 to 20, all right? That is still 20 too many, 20 too many, all right? So that is another area in which we need to help these, these soldiers, all right? So there are organizations out there that can help. There are organizations out there that will help, right? But I, as a, as a former infantryman, am not going to or will struggle to, and I will have a hard time coming home, going into my civilian and going up to a doctor saying, hey, doc, I've got some issues, right? Who I will go talk to is that other veteran out there, that Vietnam era veteran, the other GWAT veteran, the other person who I can talk the same language to, right? And I'm not a doctor, but my hypothesis is that the veterans, the 20 to 22 veterans a day are committing, who are committing suicide, many of those would not have happened had that soldier, sailor, airman, marine still been around other people that they could talk to, right? Because that's your therapy. You're sitting in the foxhole, you're sitting in a patrol base, it's raining, that's the therapy. All right, so who are some organizations that can help with these resources? Right? We have talked about um, a few of them. We've talked about the traditional ones in the American Legion, the traditional ones in the Veterans of Foreign Wars. This museum, this museum is an organization, right? It's not a structure in which we can go and look at exhibits. There are those things there. That gets people into the door. What this museum is, is the collection of individuals in this room and watching, right? That's another resource. Another one, and this is one that I relied on heavy when I was doing this, is one called Mission Roll Call, right? Mission Roll Call looked at everything and said, there are all these resources, there are all those people out there, but yet more than half of veterans are unaffiliated with some sort of an organization out there. How do we get their voices heard? And Mission Roll Call is a great organization out there doing it. So what is our call to action? What actions can we take to help provide resources for these veterans? First, this is an election year, right? Did anybody, anybody not know that? All right. It's an election year, all right? And the, the election for our next boss, our next commander in chief is taking the news, understandably, right? But we need to vote all the way down that ballot and we need to vote for veterans' issues. It doesn't matter if you're you know, a Democrat or Republican or independent, if you're red or blue, we should vote for veterans' issues. And the veterans' issues at the national level are important. Don't get me wrong, they are very important. They are just as important at the state level and the local level. So I encourage you when you're when you're looking at who am I gonna vote for to represent me at both the federal, state, and local level, you look not only at all of the issues that they're saying, but what are they doing? What are they saying about, to, and for veterans? All right? The other thing is yellow ribbons on our cars are nice. It's always nice to see those and say, you know, see the yellow ribbon sticker saying I support the troops. You know what else is nice? A letter to your congressman, a letter to your, your senator, a letter to your local leaders, right? Action, action matters, and that is where a lot of these policies with the VA, with transition help, with suicide prevention, it needs to be done through taking action, right? And then finally, lobby, and by lobby I mean educate, the local leaders about the veterans within this community. Do it social distancing, right? But take the, the city council man or take the city council woman out for coffee, all right? And talk to them about the veterans in the community. Talk to them about the veterans issues we have. Local matters and local counts. And we need to educate them on who we are and what we need and more importantly, what we can do. The next thing, we talked about resources, let's talk about advocacy, all right? What is advocacy? Well, 
advocacy is what we talked about a little bit earlier when we talked about voting, all right? We need to be the voice for these uh, veterans, for all veterans. But right now, we're focusing on these global war on terrorism, GWAP veterans, all right? Advocating for these veterans at the federal, state, and local levels is so important. Now, homelessness. We know that veteran homelessness is an issue, all right? 11% of the adult homeless population are veterans, 11%. What I think is even more striking is that veterans across all boards, 1.4 million veterans today are at risk of being homeless. And this was before the COVID stats came out. Those are numbers from a year ago. I would venture to guess that that number has increased since then. But 1.4 million of our brothers and sisters that we would gladly put an arm around, get a cup of coffee with, um, tell a war story with, may be at risk of becoming homeless, right? Education, we talked about education. Education and using the GI Bill is not just about getting a bachelor's degree or higher education. It can be, and if, and if that is what that soldier, sailor, airman, marine, wants to do, great, let's get in those resources. But the skilled trades are all covered by the, um, the GI Bill, by the post 9-11 GI Bill. Pilots training is covered by the post 9-11 GI Bill. Um, certifications covered by the post 9-11 GI Bill. So where we have an issues, connecting the veteran to that resource, all right? So we need to be advocates for and voices for that veteran. All right, so what are we doing then and what can we help do to help um, understand and advocate for these, these, um, these veterans? All right, first we need to recognize who are these folks that we need to help get resources for, who are we, these folks we need to advocate for, all right? They're your sons, they're your daughters, they're your neighbors, they're the soccer mom that you see. There's the, the guy cutting your grass, all right? It's you, it's me, it's all of us, right? They are all around us, most of the time invisible to us because we're not gonna know right away that they're a veteran, all right? So how do we help them transition? How do we best advocate for these folks? First, don't assume, right? We can never assume who the veteran is, what they've seen or what they've done. The demographics of veterans have changed over the years a lot. You now have um, females in the Ranger Regiment, right? That is an amazing, an amazing accomplishment and it's a big change for what veteran looks like, what a veteran looks like. So you can no longer go up to a female veteran and say, oh, where were you a nurse, right? Like we would have assumed in a World War II veteran, air veteran. You can go up to a female veteran and say, oh, so you were an artillery soldier. You drove a tank. You were an infantryman, infantrywoman, right? So we cannot assume who somebody is or what they experienced, even based off of their branch and or their job in the military, right? Because um, the front line doesn't exist, right? And I think a lot of the Vietnam veterans can, can um, can empathize with this too. The front line isn't a line. There is no forward line of troops anymore. It's everywhere, all right? The shootings, the attacks happen out in the wilderness and they happen on, top, on the big bases, all right? So the front lines are everywhere. So you can't assume. Help these veterans network. Network for jobs, network for relationships within the community, and network within these organizations that will help them get the help they need. Mentor, right? Mentor. Now, mentorship and friendship are not the same, right? These veterans need mentors. They need someone who can put their arm around them and help influence and guide them through life as they are making this transition. All right, and then the most important thing is to be there for them. Be there for these folks. So that way we can help navigate the VA, help transition, and help them um, stay alive, right, with the suicide prevention. 
All right, so we've talked a little bit about the resources that veterans need. We talked about the advocacy that we can, that we need to provide for them. Now, what I wanna do is talk about what I feel is the most important thing for global war on terrorism veterans and all veterans alike, which is community, right? When we talk about our time in uniform, right? We talk about the places, we talk about the things we did, right? Jumping out of an airplane was cool, but what was even cooler than that is this, right? It's the community. You can take this shot, right? Change the uniforms, and it is an infantry platoon in um, Vietnam. You can change the uniforms again, and it's an infantry platoon of World War II, Korea, World War I, the Civil War, Caesar's legions, right? These are the same. It is that community, that brotherhood, that makes folks, um, that draws you to it. It's what makes you look back going, man, those were the best days. That was great, all right? So how do we then provide that community for them, all right? So there's a couple different ways, right? First is community-focused organizations, all right? So what are community-focused organizations? And what I'm saying by that is organizations designed to build and designed to maintain and foster the veteran community. This museum is a great example of that, right? It is a group of veterans or folks who are associated with or closely associated with veterans who have a community, right? As of now, we're seeing that the, that the GWAP veterans do not feel as a part of that community as they could, right? Community, community, community is incredibly important. I mentioned um, the young man who I helped get um, a job at the, at the corporation in Illinois, all right? And I say I helped him, right, because all I did was put his resume in front of somebody. He helped me. He was that community. He was a young Marine infantryman who I could speak the same language to. Right? who I could understand, and he could understand me. My wife, I'm fortunate enough to be married to another veteran. Right? My wife helped me. My friend um, Trevor, when I was struggling with transition, flew up and met with me. Right? It's that community. I am fortunate that I had people like my wife Mindy, my friend Chris, and my friend Trevor. Not everybody has that, so we need to help provide that community for everyone. All right? Veterans need to, not should be able to, not want to, veterans need to be able to connect with other veterans, right? So um, the other way in which uh, global war on terrorism veterans need help, and, and oh, another way in which they differ actually, is a lot of research has shown that this generation of veterans want to continue to serve. They get out of uniform, they go back to their community, and they want to continue to serve and to help. Just because we took off the uniform doesn't mean we're done serving, all right? So GWAP veterans not only want to, they need to give back to their community. They need to volunteer, all right? Even if that is just connecting with other veterans why they do it. So what are some of those resources out there? Again, we talked about this museum. All right. There's a great organization called Team RWB, Team Red, White, and Blue. It connects veterans through, uh, through fitness, through physical fitness. And it is veterans all the way from you know, the, the soldier who just got out after, after their uh, two-year enlistment to, um, you know, uh, through, to World War II veterans in their 90s going out and doing hikes and walks together runs together. It is connecting and fostering those relationships. So Team Red, White, Blue is another, it's a good one. One that's giving back is another one called um, Team Rubicon, crossing uh, the Rubicon River. What do they do? They go to the disaster areas and they say, all right, well, I've got this team of veterans and first responders. Who better to deploy to a tornado in Kansas than these folks, all right? Grab your chainsaws, let's go, all right? That's another way in which these veterans are volunteering. Now. What is locally here? Right? There's this museum. That's a local organization. Team Red, White, and Blue is an organization. There's an organization called the Mission Continues. And the Mission Continues 
is where veterans of all ages can get together and they have platoons in their communities, right? There's a Denver mission continues for the Denver area. And they will go and do a community project, right? Do we need a lot cleaned out? They'll do that. Build a playground, they'll do that. Build a house, they'll do that. The mission continues as another good organization. And if you continue to look, there are multiple ways for veterans to give back. There's one called Vets Go. Um, is anybody familiar with Vets Go? And we've got some, some Vets Go folks here. I love that organization. I, I started doing some work with them a couple months ago, and I can't wait to sign back up because it's a veteran or a veteran's family member needs a ride to the hospital. I'll do that. You know, I'll go pick somebody up. We'll, we'll have a conversation while I take them, to, take them to their doctor's appointment or back. It's another way in which veterans can feel like they're giving back, and veterans can feel like what they do matters. All right. So how do we then cultivate that? What's kind of the, the thing with community? First off, the veterans today, and you guys know this, everyone in this room knows this, but the veterans provide a lot of the intangible skill sets. Bring them into your boards, into leadership positions, right? The boards um, for your nonprofits, for your um, volunteer organizations, Bring younger voices into the board because that's a great way to help them connect, right? And that is for all different types of boards. That is for all different types of organizations. So if you have an opening, if you're a part of an organization, maybe there's a younger veteran you could bring in. They can help out. Help them find meaningful, meaningful ways to give back, right? And give back at the local level give back at the local level. How can they find a meaningful way to give back at the local level, right? Dropping someone off or picking them up from their doctor's appointment is meaningful. You had that face-to-face -face interaction, that immediate gratitude or uh, gratification from that. So what are some other ways in which we can help folks um, meaningfully give back? And then finally, involve these veterans in your community. All right. In this digital age, we say, well, you know, community is um, not what it used to be. People aren't connecting like they used to be. And guess what? You know, the, when the World War II generation came back, they said, these folks don't connect like they used to. We don't, you know, we don't sit around and help each other bale hay like we used to. Just like people now are saying, we don't sit around and go bowling together like we used to. Before that, before that, before that, right? There's always some sort of a change. The community may change, but the community remains as important today as it was in the past, right? And then the last thing that I want to throw up here um, before we kind of do some questions and have a conversation is the Veterans Crisis Hotline, right? The VA Veterans uh, Crisis Line. For any veteran out there, Take this number down. If you know someone who needs this phone number, give it to them, all right? If you need someone who, or if you yourself are a veteran who needs this phone number, use this phone number, right? This is probably one of the most effective programs the Veterans Affairs has out there, all right? And I can't encourage people enough that that number 22 or, or 20 is 20 or 22 too many, all right? So thank you all so much for listening to me uh, to ramble and preach a little bit, I guess, um, during this. So does anybody have any thoughts, questions, or um, anything of the sort regarding this generation of veterans? Well, one thing I'd just like to add is uh, we'd love to do something that would help support that. And within, and within our room today, you have our, our board, current board president, and several passport presidents for the museum, our commander for the American Legion local post, which you probably know, and we would just love to kind of map out how the museum could you know, be a major player to assist in all of this. Whew, that's like, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> This is a 22 a day question. Well, it doesn't yeah. have to be solved today. Yeah, no, but, no, I, but I we'd love like it. to continue a dialogue and help us map out, you know, a role that, because we have a tremendous resource, you know, here. 
I agree. I think that, again, when I talked about those 75 pages of resources at the VA list of veteran service organizations, it's not a bad thing right, at all. There doesn't need to be an overarching you know, puppeteer for veterans. I don't think that that's the way it should work. I think veterans and community and local and, and if we can collaborate and work together, I mean, to go back to our, you know, our days on the Hudson, right? It's, it's a uh, cooperate and graduate, the same thing, right? If we all cooperate and can work together, bring in all those voices, it's, I mean, it can only be a good thing for everyone. What's an effective way to reach out to this broad range of our younger veterans? We don't see many come into the museum at all, and even when we try and advertise uh, that we can be a resource for them to come visit. So um, I'll give a, an antidote, uh, uh, um, and I will tell, how did I meet Chris, the, guy, the young Marine that I, that I met with? I was in my daughter's elementary school. They were doing a, um, it was a community night, you know, a school carnival night. And I went into one of the classrooms and there's this young man standing at a table. And one of the activities for children was to write a letter to a service member. I was like, that's a cool activity. So I came up to him and was like, well, how'd you come up with this idea? He said, oh, I was a Marine. And that's how I met him. And it wasn't just a, hey, I was a Marine. And I was like, oh, hey, I was an army man, or an instrument too. That's cool. It was, here's my phone number. I took one of those cards that they were going to write to veterans or to service members, and I wrote my phone number on it and gave it to them, right? You can't force, just like for anybody, right? We can't force them to come into the VA. We can't force folks into the um, Legion or into this museum. But we, what you can do is invite. So, and I think the invitations, while the, the YouTube Live, the social media, that's important to raise awareness, but I think what happens is it's reaching out that hand and saying, here's my phone number, let's get coffee sometime. And then it becomes, all right, well, we've got this museum, we've got this other resource. It's a personal level, it's community. It's that person with the, um, with the, with the honorably di or a discharged veteran license plate, or like mine, a 10th Mountain license plate. That starts so many conversations. I get out of my car and somebody will say, hey, you know, what battalion were you in? And that's what gets it going. Now, the next step, though, is what's your name? Here's my phone number. Oh. Yes, sir. Ryan, I'm uh, the person that's coordinating the November 11th event. Yes. And I want to thank you for uh, uh, agreeing to speak. Would you be available after things calm down to sit down and brainstorm? Because I am also on the board member who is responsible for outreach and looking for some creative ways to get veterans of all ages to come and, and become involved in what we're doing. So I'll give you a call after maybe around the first of the year and we get together. That would be great. I'd cool. love to. I like coffee. So anytime we can sit down over coffee, I'm, I'm game. Well, we have free coffee all the time here. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. Besides being the president of the uh, museum here, I'm also a member of the Vietnam Veterans of America. And of course, COVID really uh, has hurt a lot of uh, industries and, and, and groups and stuff like that. Uh, we usually have 75 to 90 members show up to our meetings. And uh, one of the things that we did a couple of years ago uh, in Arvada, the uh, traveling wall came there. We were one of the sponsors and we had our members out there giving, uh, with a, an app on our phone where we could show the people who had a name where, the, where they were located on the board. One of the things that I miss, though, is uh, we have been working with some of the cemeteries. We have what we call an, uh, an honors ceremony, an honors burial at the VA and, uh, at uh, Fort Logan. And what we do is we go to the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mortuaries and we uh, go through the names of the people that they have that haven't been claimed. And this goes back to even World War I veterans that we found. And I think we've uh, helped about uh, maybe 40 or, or 60 uh, uh, veterans that hadn't been claimed get, uh, get their honors burials. But that's one of the things that I really enjoyed doing. And we miss that because of what's going on here. But that's one of the things that we do to try to help the, the community out. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, um, my grandfather, who was a World War II veteran, died a few years ago. And at his funeral, there was a man there who didn't know him but saw the, another veteran, World War II veteran died, who was a Battle of the Bulge um, veteran. There aren't many of those left. 
right? And we have the Vietnam um, veteran generation that is the ones that now my generation needs to look for, right? And, and look towards. Because as we mentioned, um, you guys didn't get a welcome home parade until the 1980s. So how do we make sure not only are the younger veterans included, how do we make sure that the older veterans are, um, are also being taken care of and honored the way they should be? And I think that organizations like that are, are great. Any, uh, any other questions? Well, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. And we'd like to just give you one of our, our mugs since you already probably have the challenge coin. Oh, this is but awesome. This. I'll tell you, so. as, as I've mentioned, um, coffee every single day. <laughs> well, we could have it with your name on it and hung up specially so it'll always be here for you too. That'd be great. So That'd be awesome. But thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us for this. Yeah. I don't think that statistic was any better.